Hello and welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm your host, Audrey Greenberg, co-founder and chief business officer at the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. And my co-host today is Mike Dever of Brandywine Asset Management. And our guest today is Maria Machacchini from Anovis Bio. We're very excited to have her on the show. But first, Mike, I'm loving to talk to you about Brandywine today because of what's happening in the market. And I noticed that you guys offer um, both funds and separately managed accounts. Can you tell me a little bit about the difference? I was digging through on your website and I was interested to learn more about that. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. The Well, fund is um, what most people are used to, like a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund where your positions, you, 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 you get one fraction of whatever the, the whole size of that fund is. The fund makes trades that are the same for everybody that's in that fund. A managed account, you can set it up so it's structured to be customized to each individual investor. And in the case of what we do with our Brandywine protected funds, where we have equity exposure and then we protect the downside um, against excessive losses, with the um, managed accounts, we can actually take somebody's existing portfolio and provide protection to that. So they they maintain the existing stocks they have, whether it's, oh, you know, and, and you can, they could be at different institutions and they could still do that with you or would they? That's correct. Them? Oh, wow. No, they, 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 they would, they could, if that's it, uh, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or whatever it might be, um, we'll just set up to have the um, arrangement where we can provide the protection on that existing portfolio at that firm. <clears throat> Very interesting. And then you do work for all types of entities, right? So you're working with individuals, family offices, institutional investors, wealth managers, I think even retirement fiduciaries. How does, do you change your product offering for those different um, customer types or how does that work? There's, there's some differences, but not, not much in, in that way, really. So we have um, a couple different products. I mean, our brand protected funds are sort of the, the core product we're offering today because it gives people the ability to be long equities, but in, in markets like we've had now, um, not hit, be hit on the downside, you know, so they, they, they perform really well in this type of environment. And then you can recover from higher levels when the market does ultimately recover and potentially outperform the market because you had less risk. So that's sort of the main thing. And we have that offered for individuals, family offices, and then we created what's it's called a, a CIT, a collective investment trust that goes into 401k plans. So mm -hmm. a plan sponsor can say, hey, we want to offer this instead of just that naked risk where people are going to lose 30% when the NASDAQ goes into a bear market or the you know, S&P 500. We'd like to go into Brandywine's protected CIT and conceivably reduce losses to, to almost nothing. Um, yeah. And and then on the, the family office side, we do have one product that was specifically made for family office clients. Oh. That's a broadly diversified fund. Um, it, was, it was initially sponsored and um, funded by a family office who was looking for something that would give them essentially all weather performance across a variety of market conditions and protect them from inflation, um, hyperinflation, currency devaluations, and any number of different scenarios that could occur all so very a, relevant right now it, it really is yeah so we're getting a lot of interest in that because of the uh the diversification potential it offers in one fun product for family office clients that's really neat i didn't know that you guys did that so i saw in your latest newsletter it was such a great i don't know if you write those or who writes those but there was a comparison to the phillies it was obviously very timely but i found oh, it really right. relevant in how you compare the offense and the defense to risk replacement strategy. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And do you write that? Did you come up with that? I, I do. I, I usually write the monthly report. We um, we, we tend to have a um, a featured song that we we kind of you know base it on. You know this 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 month was take take me out to the ball game, um, and and it's it was in honor of the Phillies making it into the World Series. I was really hoping I'd be able to follow up with that talking about. A World Series victory, but you know, no ring this year. But um, yeah, you know, what we were talking about in there is that the the, the best investors combine both um, offense and defense, just like the best ball teams. I mean, the Phillies did great in that beginning of the World Series. They had some solid 
uh, pitching, great defense. They had a couple errors here and there, but they mostly they had some really good defense, but they also had just phenomenal offense. And if that had carried through, they'd be the World Series champions. But, you know, unfortunately, they went with two runs in the last three games. They had great defense again. They held they held them back, you know, from scoring runs, but um, they didn't score. So great investors are the same way. It's it's not just a matter of buying stocks, burying your head in the sand, saying, I, I know that it's going to go up over time. I'm just going to hang in there because there are instances um, in the U.S. as well as globally, especially globally, where you could go generation or more without getting those returns. And you, you, you don't want to play all offense. You want to make sure you have some defense for those scenarios when the environment gets difficult, like the one we're in now, especially, where you're not just suffering on the downside. I mean, the market could drop like it, it did in the 2000s. It could be down another 50% from here. And but if you just keep want to be holding, making, doesn't it even out like Jeremy Siegel stocks for the long run? If you just keep holding, does it work out like that? Or you need to put in this risk hedging strategy? There's there's two two things that I could answer that. One is it it should. Um, it, it, there's I have every expectation that the United States, especially and U.S. based uh, companies, will continue to prosper in the long run. Um, that they will they will make money, but what we need to also focus on, and I wrote about this in my, my book a decade ago, I, I wrote a book on this. And um, you, you, over the last hundred years, there were at the beginning of the 1900s, there were 34 countries that have active, vibrant stock exchanges. And yeah. only four of those lasted through the 1900s without a serious interruption or complete loss of capital to their investors. So it's, we were, the U.S. is an exception. It's an exceptional country. And I don't want to say that won't continue. I, I just don't want to bet on that exclusively. I want to okay. be in a position that if something happens that's just unexpected, um, we're protected from that. And so- like the Phillies losing the last three games. Yeah, it, you, you just, right. It, it can happen. You know, you can hit, you can hit five home runs in six innings and then go the next three games with, you know, a handful of hits. It, it can happen. And- um, does it matter so, when you put your money in, though? Or not really. Not with what we do. With what uh -huh. we do is the whole intent is the smooth returns, so that the the downsides aren't as um, dramatic, you know, as you have in a in a bear market. Yeah, we had actually. I had some investors that were looking at investing the end of last year, and they didn't. In, at the end of January, I got a call from saying, "Oh, I I don't want to invest now. It's just you know fallen so much," and it was like, "Hey." Joe, you don't know when it's going to keep falling or go back up. You don't want to be a market timer. And so what right. we're trying to do is take the market timing out of it instead of saying, hey, this is a great time to invest now. The market's dropped when it could very well drop another 50 percent or, you know, I'm going to hold off investing because it's up 50 percent. I don't want to buy at the top. This just sort of says we're going to just smooth those returns, making your investments at, at any time and hold them for the long run. And our, our tagline is, is a smarter way to buy and hold. Because it's really intended for investors that want to buy and hold, but not suffer through all the the angst and sleepless nights. And you're doing stocks and bonds, or are you guys just doing public market? What are you we, doing? So we have um, the, the protected funds are just long equities right now. We have one right, for okay. the S and P 500, and one for the Nasdaq 100. But then we have um, in that family office fund that's super broadly diversified. So it's got that those constituents to it, but it also has currency trading, some commodity exposure. Um, it, it's, it's really brought even some um, um, Bitcoin cryptocurrency exposure in that fund. So it's really broadly exposed to be able to kind of give you smooth returns over time. Okay, so we do have, I have a bunch more questions, but I guess I have to take an audience question. So we have a question from Paul Franks in Philadelphia and Paul wants to know, what makes one mutual fund more tax efficient than another mutual fund? That really gets down to the frequency of trading in the funds for the most part, because the mutual fund, if it doesn't trade a lot, doesn't pass through much taxable gain. What happens is when you invest in a mutual fund, if it sells out of a position the next day that it's been holding for 10 years and accumulated huge profits in it, you have to pay, pay your share of the profits in that. So it's, it's kind of unfair in that sense. But so the more active a fund trades, the more likely that you'll incur taxable income from that uh, than a fund that trades infrequently. 
Okay, good. Well, if you're interested out there in sending in a question, here's how to submit your question to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Again, today on our show, we have Dr. Maria Machakini. A very warm welcome to Maria. I couldn't be more excited to have such a fabulous guest on our show, one of the best biotech CEOs out there, if not one of the best CEOs of a publicly traded company. So welcome, Maria. Audrey, thank you so much. You are such a wonderful person, and this was such a great introduction. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you. And I love our viewers and our listeners to learn more about Anovis and what you're up to these days. I know the company has grown dramatically really in the last year here. I think you went from just two employees to 14. That's a huge jump. Uh, what are you up to that you're growing so fast? So we went public two and a half years ago and because we needed money to do clinical studies. And let me tell you what clinical studies we are doing. We are in Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's disease. And these studies are rather large, no matter what kind of study you're doing. So we went public because we needed the money to do two phase two studies, which would prove that our drug actually has an effect in Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's. And then we went public with two people because that's all we could afford. And so there we were. We raised enough money to do two phase two studies. We finished them last year, early this year. And basically what we found was amazing because we found that our drug improves cognition and speed of thinking in Alzheimer's patients. And it pr improves movement and speed of movement in Parkinson's patients. So we went to the FDA and asked them, can we go into phase three? And while both studies were really small, the data was good, the safety is excellent, our drug shows no side effects, the FDA said, sure. So now we started our phase three in early Parkinson's patients in August. We already recruited over 100 patients. We are doing really, really fast. And our Alzheimer's study will start in December. So in order to do that, two people really weren't enough. It doesn't matter how much I work. I just cannot <laughs> handle it. Besides, it's not my expertise. So we started hiring and we have to date 11 people and we're hiring another three, I would say before Christmas. And what's interesting is that it's not that easy to incorporate 12 people into a two company group because it's tough. And when you say two company groups, is that separating Parkinson's and Alzheimer's or something? Well, different? yes. But actually, what I meant is a two person company. Oh, I got it. Yes. Right. Okay. Also separating Alzheimer's from Parkinson's because that's the other thing. They're not exactly the same disease. And as we started to hire people, we first had both, both groups, both projects being run by the same people. Now we have to start differentiating. When, when we talked last, you had, um, you really kind of teased with a um, result you had, and I think it was in the phase two with Parkinson's, maybe on mice, um, where you were seeing just, just massive improvements. Um, it, can you, Talk a little bit about that. And then, I mean, obviously that's probably the results of that's what led into phase three here. Uh, I think when I talked last, we had the first 14 Parkinson's patients. <clears throat> and the data was good because they actually moved 30% faster and they moved 30% better. Now the study was larger, 
So between then and now, we treated 54 patients, and that's why we know that we have statistically significant improvement by about 30% in movement and movement of speed. And then we have 30% improvement in cognition and speed of cognition. Yeah, and what's interesting about your your drug is that you're actually shutting something off, right? Rather than activating something. But maybe you can explain that a bit more, what's happening in the brain and some of these neurodegenerative diseases and how your product's effective in, in dealing with that. So that's an interesting question because what happens in Alzheimer's, but also in Parkinson's and also in Huntington's, and actually to a certain degree, it can happen in psychiatric diseases, is that the brain is injured. What that exactly means is that there is high, le high levels of iron in the brain. And iron activates proteins that turn toxic. So when, uh, when the brain is injured, iron goes up, toxic proteins are activated, and they kill nerve cells. As mm -hmm. it turns out, these same toxic proteins kill nerve cells in every neurodegenerative disease ever tested. It's the same proteins, and one of them is pretty well known. It's a beta that causes plaque in Alzheimer's. Another one is coming to be known. It's the one that causes tangles in Alzheimer's. And then the third one is maybe more known by people that have Parkinson's. It's alpha cyanocline that causes Lewy bodies. These proteins all are toxic. They all kill nerve cells. And we shut them off. And by shutting them off, we protect nerve cells from dying. Interesting. Do you, yeah, do you ahead, think please. there's yeah, do you think there's a possibility of reversing or just slowing or stopping? What what is the end goal with this drug? So that's an excellent question. And here I have to go back to the mice you mentioned. In mice. Okay, we stop the disease no matter when and where. We tried young mice, old mice. We tried Alzheimer mice, Parkinson's mice, Down syndrome mice, traumatic brain injury, stroke. No matter where, we shut the disease off in terms that it is stable. We do not improve it. Now, in humans, Stopping the disease is very ambitious because no drug has done that to date. And we have worked on Alzheimer's drugs and Parkinson's drugs for over 30 years. And there isn't one drug on the market or in development that actually stops the course. In all cases, they either improve symptoms for a while or eventually may slow the course. So if our drug actually stops the disease from progressing, that would be a great great improvement. However, from our small phase two studies, our drug improved the symptoms by 30%. So we are kind of between hoping it may improve some to being reasonably sure that it will stop the course from getting that's, worse. That's great. And does it differ between Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body? I noticed you're actually working on some ocular perhaps indications as well. How does it differ the... Um, the mechanism of action in terms of these different disease types, um, is it similar or, or much, much different? Well, it's actually identical. And in a, in a, for a long time, I had a hard time explaining that to people because people think that neurodegenerative diseases are very specific. You have Alzheimer's, you have Parkinson's, you have glaucoma. But in all these diseases happen, nerve cells die. They die. End of the story. If they weren't dying, you wouldn't lose the function. And our drug protects them from dying in all these disorders. And in some cases, it works in the retina, like in glaucoma. In some cases, it works in the periphery, the tongue for slurring speech, the feet for shuffling, the hands for trembling, like in Parkinson's. And in some cases, it works in, in the brain where nerve cells have to communicate with each other to have cognition, memory, and learning. And in all cases, it protects them from dying. So I, I have, I'm back to that last, the question I asked before, because I'm, I mean, it's really intriguing that you're saying that, and, and I know it's, it's, it's been a struggle finding anything that works with Alzheimer's, um, even to slow it, it, it seems like it's not working. But you're talking about potentially not just 
slowing but having some reversal um, as the oh, potential? I, that is a very ambitious goal. I'm saying it stops the disease. That's my okay. official version. I'm just and, saying in animals and in the few patients we treated, it improves. And and how long will it be with this phase three before we start getting results or you're able to announce results? So, you know, usually a 500 patient study takes two years. That's all the quotes we got, two years. I go, no, 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 it's not possible. No, 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 no. I think it's going to take eight months. And you know why? Because we published our data. It's published peer-reviewed journal. Parkinson's patients are very eager to learn. They are telling all their friends the stuff works. I have 275 volunteers in the United States that, that all they all want to participate. To date, we only have 22 sites out of 100 open, and we already have 100 people enrolled. So I think we're going to get our interim analysis in February and the end of the study in October, November. And how, you're working on a lot of different programs right now, right? I mean, there's, I think I saw in your pipeline, there was at least eight different, is it eight? No, how many? Well, yes, that's all the things we could do. Realistically, oh, I see. we had a meeting with the board because, you know, it's so easy to say, sure, this is a wonderful orphan indication. Why don't we do that also? I mean, you don't have a patent on ALS. Let's do ALS. So no, we actually are doing Alzheimer's. Parkinson's, and then we may be doing eventually, maybe starting in one to two years, Lewy body dementia. The reason for Lewy body dementia, it is exactly a mixed pathology between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. People shake and they become demented. They have actually both diseases. And right now there is absolutely nothing, not even something symptomatic that helps these people. Yeah, my cousin passed away from Lewy body last year. It was a horrible disease, and it's really hard. It happens very quickly, and it's very hard to witness. That's with any of these neurodegenerative um, indications, and I do believe awareness is important. Actually, um, AFTV, the Association for Frontal Tempora, um, is in Philadelphia, too. You guys should meet up and talk about awareness, but certainly you're spreading the gospel as well. You know, Maria, I'd be love to hear a little bit about your personal story. I, I've l learned a little bit about it, but you have such a fascinating background. How did you get into this? What motivates you every day? And can you tell us a little bit about your personal story? So the fact that I love the brain, I think I was 22, 23 when I decided I love the brain. So I started looking around and I tell you that many years ago, there was very little known about the brain. I mean, I could study Freud and I did not enjoy that at all. So forget Freud, forget psychoanalysis. And I went into biochemistry. The reason I figured with biochemistry, you will understand whatever happens, doesn't matter in which organ, but you will understand what happens. So I got a PhD in uh, biochemistry, two postdocs in molecular biology. And then I actually was doing cloning. That was the hard thing to do. And it was easy to become a US citizen if in those days you could come because nobody was cloning. And um, well, then I think that was um, almost over 30 years ago, I went into the brain and I've been sticking with the brain. So my first company that I started in 92, actually was supposed to protect nerve cells from dying in stroke. Needless mm -hmm. to say, it didn't work. There is still absolutely no drug on the market today that protects nerve cells from dying in stroke. However, we were lucky. Genomics had just become the thing to do. And we were working with brain and we had some genes. So we became a brain genomics company. And we sold for cash, which was nice. We sold for money. Investors were happy. I was happy. And I became an angel investor. I didn't really know what to do, but somehow I wanted to protect nerve cells from dying. And I ran into this technology that turned out to be a little different from what I thought it was, but actually turned out to be much better than what I thought it was. It protects nerve cells from dying and it protects them in stroke. So I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> where was the, uh, where did you discover that? 
technology that uh, the intellectual I, property. I actually, when I was a um, retired angel investor, I would still go to neuroscience meetings because, you know, I like the brain and I was too young to really, really retire. So I met this guy who was telling me how great this technology was. It was at NIH and I licensed it. Interesting. Yeah. So that's been yeah, I was going to say, it's been a long story. I mean, that was a while ago. Yes. That and, you did that. And as I said, the, the technology really didn't work out the way he thought. So <laughs> we have 44 patents on the technology that have nothing oh. to do with him, but it's working. It's working. Yeah. Well, it's it, your perseverance is amazing. Yeah. And speaking of perseverance, it takes a lot to be a CEO of a publicly traded company. Why did you decide to go public and how is that going? Wow, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I mean, I, I briefly mentioned that we have a lot of animal models. When you have no money, the government may give you NIH, NIA, they may give you some two, three, four hundred thousand dollars to do another animal model. So Michael J. Fox gave us some money, DOD gave us some money, we have Parkinson's, we have traumatic brain injury, we have Alzheimer's. We have all these animals, but in the end, I didn't want to develop an animal drug for mice. I wanted to develop a human drug for humans. So I, I didn't have an option. The only yeah. option to raise enough money was going public. I think we are fine. I mean, it's, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of, but it's fine. We are in, we are in all the regulations. We do fine. So what are you, you have, looking most forward to here in the future? I want the Alzheimer's and the Parkinson's data, both by the end of next year. That will be two phase three studies. And then yeah. we can do another three and then we'll, do, we'll be done. Will you be at that point um, partnering with a larger company for distribution? Will you try to raise additional funds on your own? Do you see the existing investors and people like Michael J. Fox Foundation, do they come back in and and fund further development? Uh, yeah, what's the future look like? So let me ask the simple question first. That's Michael J. Fox. So Michael J. Fox, a while ago, I think in 15, paid for a Parkinson's mouse study, okay? And now we went back to them and we went back to them with a $30 million study and asked them to put in a million because they do not pay for a $30 million right. study. That's just not in their possibilities, realm of possibilities, that will kind of deplete their funds. So we, you know, the 1 million you can say is worth it is not, it is worth it because they do give you their input. They actually look at the study. They, they help you, they help you with a recruitment of patients. So that 1 million brings them in, it brings the patients in and it brings the scientific community in. So yes, we are looking at grants, but we're really more looking at grants to increase awareness of the drug. Now, in terms of what I want to do, see, I'm a scientist at heart. I don't want to run sales. I would sell the darn drug for $3. Why charge 100000 if you can charge three? But nobody in this world will let me sell the drug for $3. So I think it's better if I give it up. Uh -huh. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you today, doctor. Thank you so much for being on the show. Our next guest on Money Matters TV is Kevin Brown, president and CEO of Acasino. So thank you so much for watching Money Matters TV and we'll see you next time.